Welcome to the Walk Around Podcast. Our goal is to share with you the insights, skills, the processes, and the leaders that are influencing the retail automotive landscape today. I'm one of your hosts, Nick Funch, and as always, joined by Danny. Hey, good Danny. To, good to see you, Nick. Super excited about our guest today, Jason Stein. Hey, Jason. Gentlemen, how are you? Nice to be with you. We're doing great. So uh, Jason is Vice President and Publisher of Automotive News, as well as Publisher of Automotive News Canada, China, and Europe. Jason oversees more than 75 reporters and editors around the world, from Detroit to Paris to Shanghai. In addition to his editorial responsibilities, he also leads the digital sales, marketing, event, and audience departments. Jason joined Automotive News as a Detroit-based reporter in October of 2003 and held various domestic and international roles before being named publisher in 2013. In 2016, he led the launch of two new media products, Automotive News Canada, a digital media source and monthly print magazine, and the Fixed Ops Journal, a semi-monthly print magazine focused on automotive retail operations. In 2018, he helped Automotive News launch its Shift Mobility magazine. Before joining Automotive News, Jason was an award-winning automotive columnist, news and sports writer for several North American newspapers, in Ontario, Ohio, and Indiana. Jason also hosts the Daily Drive podcast in conjunction with Automotive News. Danny, let's take a walk around with Jason. Yeah, Mr. Worldwide, Jason Stein himself. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, for, for those of us that um, haven't had the experience and exposure like you, VP and publisher of Automotive News, what's a day in the life kind of look like for you these days? Uh, well, I think it's um, <laughs> it's changed a lot in the last uh, six or seven months, obviously. But what I would say is that no two days are the same. Um, the uh, some of the areas that you walk through that um, that I'm fortunate enough to be able to work with our teams uh, in and around uh, provide a, a lot of interesting um, uh, what I would say uh, creative angles out in the world that we're that that we look at all the time. So. Uh, whether it's a you know a breaking news story uh, that occurs in the automaker supplier dealer beat, or whether it's um, a uh, new uh, regulation that's going into effect in in uh, California that that would change the scope of the auto industry going forward, or if it's one of our what used to be 24 live events or now probably 50 virtual events, um, there's. Variety being the spice of life, there's a lot of spice. Mm. Yeah, it's certainly, uh, I think it's provided that for all of us this year. But, you know, through adversity, I think we all grow. And I think um, the auto industry is no different, right? There's uh, been an accelerant around innovation and the ability to, to help the customer. But I think one of the things I'm super interested in, Jason, and probably jealous of more than anything, Danny, is your sight lines into all things automotive, whether it's um, the retail side, and you touched on it right there, the manufacturing side, the supplier side, um, and then the legislative side. You know, as you kind of peer across that landscape, um, what what do you see as some opportunities for potentially the reset retail side of the business as, as we start to kind of come around the bend in this uh, pandemic? Yeah, the opportunities are around uh, an accelerant that we could not have imagined uh, back around NADA in February. Everybody talked about how the world needed to move into a digital space at a much faster clip. We talked about how dealers were dinosaurs and just weren't adapting to uh, what consumers wanted in, in the February 2020 world. And then March 2020 hit. What we've seen happen is, um, as best described by one of our guests on uh, on our World Congress virtual conversations this spring is that uh, the retail world went probably accelerated three to five years in three to five months, um, and and it's it's so true at every level. Whether it's handling consumers in a different way, whether it's responding to customer needs that are dramatically uh, or were dramatically different and are dramatically different now, um, or it's just simply the digitization aspect of the retail space, which the really progressive dealers have moved very, very fast. And I think what you've seen is that those those dealers who were ready for the change and who were uh, prepared to take on a whole new virtual experience or 
um, address consumer needs that were drastically uh, different are ready for it. Those who were not might still not be. And so uh, you, you really, through, you know, through the years, I've had the good fortune of talking to some very advanced, uh, progressive, uh, technically savvy dealership groups. And those ones who had the process and the skill and the acumen to, uh, to hit the pedal um, come uh, factory reopening time or retail store reopening time have just absolutely moved fast. They, and, and they will benefit in the long run. And, and so I think that, that, that technology piece of it that we all kind of uh, used to wring our hands a little bit and rub our chins and say, well, I don't know if it's going to happen. Uh, it's a, maybe it's happening, you know, not fast enough. Well, the world happened. And so uh, those who have led have led with authority. And Jason, as you think back, so with automotive news since 2003 and prior to that, writing about automotive and, and close to it, um, has, have you seen anything so disruptive so quickly? I mean, is there anything we can pull from as dealers? I think the um, I'd be interested in your thoughts there. No, I don't think we've seen anything that's that's happened that's been as fast as this. Everybody likes to talk about 2008 and 2009 as the previous benchmark. The reality is that that was a very slow process um, in, in the sense that things did not close overnight, obviously. Uh, factories did not shut down overnight and take months to reopen. Um, there was not as much uh, ambiguity around restarts uh, and or how the consumer was going to be able to buy a vehicle. Um, sure, it was a dramatic financial adjustment. And yes, there were uh, certainly lessons learned, uh, particularly on the, on, the, on the financial piece of it, cost containment side. But this was a light that went off uh, overnight. And um, as, as hard as it is to shut down immediately, it's even more difficult to turn back on. You see that in various aspects of our society today. Uh, but you know, the bottom line is that we have never seen, at least you know, my lifetime, or I, I would venture to say most lifetimes, we have not seen the drastic change that had occurred uh, in that mid-March timeframe that now um, we're, we're somewhat more accustomed to but still grappling with uh, at every level. Um, and and as, as we've seen, you know, the fall hit of second, second waves, um, things of that nature and, and uh, areas tightening now again, um, things being limited again, it, it's a lot to deal with at one time. So there, to answer your question, there, 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 was no, um, there was no example that we could pull from here. One of the things I found, I was having a conversation with a, um, a leader the other day, and he was reflecting on one of the benefits of, of automotive retail that other retail outlets or restaurants haven't had is the benefit of pent up demand. And um, meaning that if someone needs a car um, today and they can't buy a car, they still need a car tomorrow. And so um, it's causing dealers to, I think, think about their business differently. And I think, as dealer, the, the interesting thing to me is, is dealers have had to adapt quickly to, to meeting the customer where they want to be met. And, um, you know, I think to your point earlier, Jason, making the point around um, the dealers that were ahead of the curve um, pre this disruption have been able to really hit the accelerant coming out, um, coming out of this, the disruption. So, Jason, something you said that I think is interesting is, and it's just the reality we're all kind of living through is, you know, obviously there was those few months in the spring and into the summer and we all kind of, we got it. We knew what we had to do. Things were shutting down, the doors were closing. And now as things start to reopen, there's, you know, a lot of talk about, well, what does this look like into the fall, into the spring, into the winter and into next year? And as a consumer, you know, what can dealers be doing to, to maybe be instilling trust and instilling a sense of safety and you know we're going to take care of you when you do decide to come in. Like like Nick was saying, there may be this pent up demand. What can dealers be doing outside of the technology space to help meet customers where they are? Yeah, I think what they're doing now is what they're going to only continue to do and have for the most part already started, which is uh, really let their communities um, know that they that there's a safe environment that they as dealers have thought through all of the protocols. Um, some 
really progressive dealers who have made sure that in their marketing to their communities, that they're constantly hitting on that message that, look, we have inventory for you, or we'd like your used car. Right. Uh, but, but frankly, um, you can, you can come into our space. We're more than happy to meet you uh, halfway. Some other folks who are again on that cutting edge are doing a lot of in-home visits uh, delivery uh, uh, that's uh, uh, touchless uh, to some extent, making sure that, that their customers know that they've gone to every length to sanitize and to, and to put all of the, um, I would say safety protocols in place, even within their store, the use of plexiglass, the use of stickers on the floor, all the stuff that you see in, in other places now that have become, you know, commonplace, uh, the mask wearing things of that nature. And so I, I, I think they're doing what they're, what needs to be done and will only continue to make their process that much more efficient. Um, there are some examples of some small hotels now that I think some dealers are learning from where you just don't have that front desk experience uh, that you used to have. Uh, you know, keys are left in a, in a, in a secure area, uh, mobile app check-ins, um, some, some other areas where, you know, the airline industry to some extent has been ahead of that. Uh, obviously, Uber was um, uh, at the forefront of some of that. Uh, technology as it as it came to app development and uh, ease of efficiency user experience that just gets uh, better and better. So I, I think dealers will continue to learn. They're going to learn from each other. They're going to use all those virtual uh, best practices they possibly can and just create a more inviting environment uh, for the customer going forward. And so uh, that's a little short term view there. If you as you think about a little longer term, um, and the industry as a whole. From your vantage point, what, what excites you about kind of automotive and, and all the different areas that, that you touch? I think it's technology that's just moving incredibly quickly. Um, and that's just not obviously in the, in the consumer experience, but it's in the development of uh, vehicles and, and, and even the different definitions of mobility going forward. We're, we're dealing with a company now that's moving very, very fast into the uh, uh, car slash uh, air uh, space, you know, the so-called flying cars of, of uh, you know, uh, Buck Rogers or the Jetsons. Um, yeah. and, and there's some real prototypes that are out there being tested right now. There's a lot of money that's being invested into that space in particular. And um, as, as, as the automotive world wanes a little bit on autonomous uh, riding or uh, car sharing, given the situation that's gone on, they're just going to plow more and more resources into advanced electrification, propulsion systems, fuel cells, and air mobility, so that it will become uh, somewhat commonplace uh, within a longer term view to have a vehicle that not only serves your needs on the ground, but possibly in the air. And uh, we just recently wrote a story where um, we interviewed uh, the technology leader at a Toyota globally. Uh, Californian, actually, and um, he was telling us that uh, his his dream, uh, you know, sketched out onto uh, a white piece of paper on a daily basis, is is a is one that includes a, a advanced air mobility in the Toyota space. So it's not just the stuff of science fiction anymore; it's really coming. And I think um, the amount of money that's available to to pour into investments and resources to make the automotive world so much more technical in 10 years than it is today is really exciting. It's a, certainly a fun time to um, be close to automotive and in automotive is not only we shift with kind of consumer demands, but the industry shifts as a whole and in, in transportation needs. Um, and it is, I think, amazing to think about where we'll be in 10 years and, and what seemed like unfathomable is, is we're a lot closer to it. So it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, pivoting just a little bit, you know, I'm curious uh, myself, uh, you've been with Automotive News some period of time. Um, you've kind of worked your way up to, to leading the Automotive News team. As you, th as you think about your own career and kind of reflect on it, any good career advice that, that you either anchored to throughout your career or, or um, that you could pass along to maybe some others? Yeah, I'll go back to what our chairman, Keith Crane, asked me in uh, 2005, where you know, I'd only been 
two years at Automotive News in two different reporting positions. One was covering marketing. The second was covering General Motors, which at that time, you know, GM still had 25 plus percent market share. And um, and he came to me and he said, I'd, I'd, I'd like you to take an overseas assignment and I'd, I'd like you to move to Munich and be at our Automotive News Europe headquarters. Um, at that point, um, you know, his, his only advice to me was, uh, you know, you you have an opportunity to really expand your cultural uh, horizons, your personal horizons, and um, uh, there's a sweet spot where where you can do that in your in your personal life, in your family life, and it was it was just perfect for us. And that kind of well-rounded uh, education, if you will, a, a little bit of a of a of a PhD that they paid for uh, on the job training was probably the best advice. Is that you know, you, you, you take those chances, you, uh, you know, there I was covering the, the biggest beat in the industry at a time when, um, well, just it was the, the precipice of the General Motors uh, crash, actually, and uh, would have been a great time to be a reporter on the ground covering General Motors. But, you know, there was a bigger, a bigger picture out there. And, and that allowed me to really get to know uh, industry leaders in other regions of the world. Um, those leaders in those European headquarters, in some cases, would move on to North American roles, in some cases would take other global roles. But yet, you know, there I was in uh, 2005 through 2009, getting to know them at a when they were, you know, I knew you when type of uh, scenario. So, you know, Keith, Keith really put an opportunity in front of me, um, said that I would never uh, regret it and that uh, a piece of that experience would live with me every day uh, after it was over. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happened. So I think that's just the case of taking chances, taking risks, uh, pushing out of your, um, you know, at that time would have been an absolute comfort zone and, um, and tackling new challenges. Well, I love that. Um, I made a note here around kind of look for opportunities to expand your horizons. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think for everyone, it doesn't necessarily have to be an overseas assignment. It could be no. something in your dealership, right? Mm -hmm. It could be, Same thing. Uh, you know, um, look, look for opportunities to kind of stretch yourself. Um, so, well, Danny, this has been great. I think having Jason on and, and Jason, thank you. Having kind of your perspective and your thoughts around uh, how dealers have dealt with uh, the disruption this year, and more importantly, kind of where we're headed as an industry has um, certainly been beneficial. So thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. It's an exciting time in the industry, uh, and it will continue to be. And there's a lot of stories out there for us to write going forward. So it's, that's good news for everybody. Yeah. And if you uh, want to hear more from Jason, be sure to check out his podcast, The Daily Drive. Um, you can find it on automotivenews.com or through your favorite podcast channels. Um, and as always, um, be sure to like and share the daily drive and like and share the walk around too. So um, thanks, Jason. Have a great week. Thanks so Thank you. Thank you both.